Cynthia is going to give a few closing remarks. Great. <laughs> and we thank you. We, we know it's we're at 534. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. Cynthia is our president elected in January and has been our fearless leader. Thank you. Can you hear me well enough? Yes. Yes. Excellent. There's nothing I could possibly add to what Matthew just said. I have some remarks written out. I'm not reading them. I just want to make a couple of points. Um, one is that, uh, as Matthew said, we're, we're facing this tremendous challenge. Um, Debbie and Melody entrusted this place to us because they trusted us to do the right thing with it. And Matthew has described better than I could um, much of what we are planning and hoping to do. Um, I, he's already told you, because I was going to make the point, that uh, he Rex was told over and over and over that what he was trying to do was impossible. He could not do it. And his response to that was to prove them, those people, wrong. Because, as Matthew said, he did everything he set out to do. He succeeded so well that the state of Connecticut wanted to buy the entire collection of 874 paintings, which they did. So that was wonderful. But, as you've also heard, those paintings are in drawers at the Dodd Center in Stores, Connecticut. They take wonderful care of them. We are grateful to them, and we have a good partnership with UConn. They are planning to build a new science museum on the Stores campus someday, and that museum is going to have a brazier wing. This is the plan which would be wonderful. But, as Matthew has explained, we are going to have a museum of a different nature. Um, and one of the things I wanted to say was that, and Matthew's already kind of said it, but the whole point about Rex was, well, the, the step back. These, this is not just about paintings. I was trying to explain to somebody who knew nothing about Rex the other day, and she said, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not necessarily that interested in, in bird paintings. I said, yes, but that, that really isn't what this is about. Rex didn't just paint birds. He knew them. He knew what birds did. He knew what birds were like, and not in an anthropomorphic way. He was very clearly understood birds were very different from humans in many ways that are far, far preferable to humans, which is why he preferred their company. So it is completely fitting that we have a museum on the property that was his haven that allowed him to complete these projects of the paintings and then producing these extraordinary books, which again, he succeeded in doing, but <laughs> because at the time, the people who bought those volumes were mostly uh, libraries and very wealthy individuals who in many cases ended up donating those volumes, those sets, to university library special collections. So again, these are all over the country in libraries, some you've heard of, some you've never heard of, but nobody knows about them anymore because they're well cared for, but they're hidden away. One example, the Houston Museum of Art and Science, and there was a long road to how this happened, but a curator there happened to come across a set of the volumes that they had been donated to Rice University and they ended up at the Houston Museum of Art and Science. 
they were so amazed by these volumes that they created an entire exhibit. Um, this was just about a year ago, and it was up for several months. And it was they they simply took the prints actually out of the volumes, which are made so that you can do that, and mounted them. And it was just a phenomenally beautiful exhibit. But the point is that when people learn about Rex, they get it. So our mission and our um, museum are going to be devoted to Rex, the person, the process, and what mattered to him. And I just want to say, I was going to say this in the beginning, I have to really say thank you to Melody and Deborah Brazier, um, because we wouldn't be here without them, obviously. And they both had great vision in their own ways. They were both lifelong educators. Many, Some of you may know, Melody taught at Kent Center School for many, many, many years, second and third grade. She's still remembered by people in Kent, either as their teacher or their child's teacher. Deborah taught at the Renbrook School in West Hartford for four decades um, and was a revered teacher there. And they believed that we could do this. And that's why we're going to do it. Um, so, the, Finally, I do have to thank, I'm sorry, I just have to read this because I will, I don't want to miss somebody. I just have to thank the, um, this is not a very practical note, the very lovely people who provided the food, Willa Millerton, Millerton Wine and Spirits, Fitzky Bakery, Ten Mile Table, Thistle Pass Farm, and Form and Light for the florals, for the all for the food, the florals, and the libations, obviously so the wine. So thank you. And we, uh, we're very grateful to them. Um, and I also just want to say because we just learned this, and it's very exciting. Um, as as Matthew mentioned, we one of the things we've been trying to do is forge partnerships with a lot of local organizations. Um, both, uh, you know, community organizations and in particular land trust. Uh, we just learned that the Kent Land Trust um, has gotten a grant from Cornell Lab of Ornithology to conduct a bird assessment, bird habitat assessment on the Brazier property. Yeah. So that's going to happen in the next possibly in the next six months. Um, and we are very um, much um, forging a partnership with Kent Land Trust. Michael Howells was here earlier, and I, I know he had to leave, and I know Tony Zanino was here, and he may have just left, but, um, and we're very grateful to Connie Manis for her part in that, and that is something that's going to continue because part of the mission is protecting this land um, and making sure that it can be accessible to the public as much as possible in in its natural state. As Matthew said, we would we, the idea is we would have trails, mm -hmm. and then the museum would be right there. Um, so it would both be protecting the land and preserving Rex's legacy. Um, and so that brings me to the fact that we do really need to raise money. <laughs> so um, we, are, we are very grateful for everyone who has supported us for quite a while, and particularly this last year. Um, but what I, what I wanted to say here is, if you can spread the word, that is what we need as much as anything, is people understanding what we're up against um, and why this is important. And I don't think I probably need to say to this group of people why the environmental part of this is hugely important um, and was to Rex even in the 20s when you read his all these amazing things that we are fortunate to have now. 
Um, he was very aware of birds becoming extinct, of habitat changing, um, of hum what humans do um, that's destructive. And, um, and birds had special meaning for him because there's a reason that um, the canary in the coal mine is, is a bird. And uh, so if you can, each of you in your own ways, just direct people to our website, which is rexbrazier.org, encourage anybody you know, it's any donation of any size is most welcome. Um, we would love to have somebody give us very large checks, but we are also very grateful for literally whatever anyone feels able to give. And the more that gets out into the world, the more, the faster we will succeed at this. And I thank you all for coming and having, staying through this amazing program. Um, and on this rainy day. Thank you very, very, very much.